Hello, welcome back to my YouTube channel. And if today is your first day of visiting this channel, please watch this video to the end. You're going to get so much value. Today, I'm going to answer all your questions under nuclear physics. Every question under nuclear physics. And this one is straight to the answer. What you are expecting in your exams, I'm going to be giving you answers to them. And you know the way I teach? I teach with things that will help you remember easily. I explain with materials, with things common. So you're going to enjoy every bit of this video. Please watch it to the end. If you want distinction, if you want to understand everything in nuclear physics, please watch this video to the end. Okay, the first question, what is nuclear physics? I will be starting with answering this question, helping you understand what is nuclear physics before we we'll go straight to the questions and answers. What is nuclear physics? Nuclear physics is a branch of physics that studies the nucleus of an atom, its constituents, and their interaction. In our class today, we will be looking at this as an atom. Nuclear physics studies the nucleus of an atom, so we'll be taking this, I'm using something common to show you to represent an atom. This is what I'll be using for the explanation. Then the nucleus, we'll be looking at the makeup, the constituent, the makeup of this atom and how they interact. How did nuclear physics come about? Nuclear physics was discovered in the year 1911 by Ernest Rutherford. He was scattering alpha particles with air, aluminium foil, and gold leaf. So in the process of scattering alpha particle, he at the center is massive. Mass is concentrated at the center. So having discovered that the mass is concentrated at the center, and he observed that the center is positively charged, he called the center the nucleus of an atom. Now let me tell you this. If we are looking at this as an atom, let this just be an at our atom. Then the constituents, the makeups. We have two makeups. Just as I'm using this to represent the makeups, we are going to use the seed of this orange and this fiber as the two major things that make up the nucleus, the center of an atom. Remember, the center is massive. That and it's positively charged. So he called it the nucleus. This is our atom now. I'm going to call the fiber the proton. Let this fiber be the proton and let the seed be the neutral. So the makeup of this atom at the center, the nucleus, is proton and neutral. Proton, remember we are using the fiber, is positively charged. And the neutron, the seed, has no charge. If the neutron has no charge and the fiber is the proton occupying everything majorly, then we are going and the, is positively charged. We can simply say that the nucleus of an atom is positively charged. So in the year 1911, Rutherford discovered this and called it the nucleus of an atom. Okay, the next question now. Define the following proton number, nuclear number, three isotope, four binding energy, five mass defect. Let me start with the first one, proton number. Proton number is the number of proton. It is another name for proton number. It's atomic number. Let's use the letter Z to represent it. Proton number is the number of proton in the nucleus of an atom. Atomic number is proton number. It is the number of proton in the nucleus of an atom. For the mass number, the mass number or nuclear number is the total number of proton and neutron in the nucleus of an atom. Let's use the letter A to represent the mass number or you can call it nuclear number it is the number of the proton and neutron in the nucleus of the atom then isotopes isotopes 
are atoms of an element which have the same atomic number but different mass number. So if they have the same atomic number, it means they have the same number of proton. And if they have different mass number or different nuclear number, it means they have the different number of neutral. So isotopes are atoms of the same element having the same atomic number or proton number but different mass number or nuclear number. So they have different number of neutron. For instance, let's take isotope of carbon, carbon 12 and carbon 14. So they have different neutron number, but the same atomic number. For the binding energy, binding energy is the energy required to separate the nucleons from the nucleus of an atom. This is the nucleus of an atom. Remember I said the fiber and the seed are representing our proton and our neutron. So binding energy is the energy, the minimum energy required to separate. Let me start peeling off all the steam. The minimum energy required to separate the nucleus, that's the proton and the neutron from the nucleus of an atom is the binding energy. The greater the binding energy, the greater the stability of the atom. More energy is required to separate it. The greater the binding energy, the greater is stability. For the next question, what is mass defect? Mass defect is the difference between the mass of an atom and the sum of the masses of its individual constituent. For instance, remember we are using a our fiber and the proton as the constituent of an atom. Now mass, we are talking about the mass defect. We are talking about the difference in mass when the atom is alone, just standing alone, and then when it is combined together. The difference in their masses is mass defect. And now this mass defect, when it is standing alone, it is less, let's say number one. Then number two, when it is combined, that is the sum of the masses of the constituent element. That is the mass of the proton plus the mass of the neutron combined together is greater than the mass of the atom, the original atom standing alone. So this is the mass defect. The difference in mass for each of them. When it is standing alone, that's the original atom. Then the sum of the two atoms combined together, that of proton and that of neutron, their sum combined together is greater than when the atom, than the original mass of the nucleus. For the next question, what is emission spectra? State the three types of emission spectra. Name one source, each, which produce each of the spectra. Emission spectra. I'm going to use something like hell la. Hell la. Remember that when an atom moves from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, there is emission. So the E there at the center of H and L moving from higher to lower. That's why I said hell. Now the la there now. You know, I'm using some things that are simple, easy to remember. So you always remember, when an atom is moving from a lower to a higher energy level, let's say la, look at the A at the center, so showing absorption. So we have emission spectra and absorption spectra. Now what is emission spectra? Emission spectra are obtained when light from a luminous source undergoes dispersion and is observed directly. Remember, we, I use the word now, dispersion. They are obtained when light from a luminous source undergoes dispersion, that is emission, and are observed directly. So we have three types of emission spectra, line spectra, band spectra, and then continuous spectra. The number three, how they are obtained, the line spectra, the band spectra, and the continuous spectra. Now for line spectra, line spectra, they are distinct and separate bright light of different wavelengths. They are distinct, separate, and you can see it's 
distinct separate just bright lines obtained of different wavelengths obtained on a black background then how do we get it we can get it from hydro hydrogen gas neon gas on a discharge too all those gases on a discharge too that's atom in discharge too that is how to get the line spectra band spectra have many distinct groups or bands of line and they are very close together at one side of each other Band spectra are obtained from molecules of carbon dioxide in a discharge tube. Remember that for line spectra, you can get it from hydrogen or neon gas. But for band spectra, you get it from molecules such as carbon dioxide in a discharge tube. Then for continuous spectra, a source, the source is from solid, liquid or gases at very high temperature. So these are the sources of all this spectra okay the next example the diagram below illustrates the energy level of an electron in an atom if an excited electron moves from n2 to n0 calculate the frequency the Planck's constant h is given as 6.6 .6 times 10 raised to power minus 34 joule seconds the electron volt is given as 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19 joules then the speed of light C is given as 3 times 10 raised to power 8 meter per second. Okay, let's take the let's solve the calculation now. Please don't forget to subscribe. Just hit the subscribe button. Okay, now the solution energy E is equal to the Planck's constant times the frequency. This is the formula we are going to use. From this formula, we are going to derive another formula. Let's call this one 1. Remember that the wave equation V is equal to F lambda. That's the speed is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So if we are using now the speed of light C is equal to F lambda. So let's make frequency the subject of the equation so that we divide both sides by the wavelength. C is equal to F. Let's divide both sides by the wavelength so that the wavelength can cancel the wavelength. We just have that the frequency F is equal to C over the wavelength. So let's use this to form another equation such that Let's put this in equation one. Energy E is equal to H. In place of F, we are going to put C over lambda. Then we are going to call it equation two. Equation two. Equation one and two are the major equations we are going to use in solving this problem. Okay, the first thing is to find the change in energy as it moves from E2 to E0. So we are going to find the difference in energy. Remember at E2, it has minus 2.0 minus, then the energy at E0 is minus 12. And all this energy is in electron volt. That's the unit, electron volt. So, if we do that, we are going to have minus 2. Minus minus is plus 12, all in electron volts. So that will give us 10 electron volts. This is the change in energy. So one electron volt, as we are giving, that one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19 joules. So 10 electron volts, the change in energy now is going to be 10 times the electron volt, which is 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19 joules. We can now apply the using the formula number one, the frequency F is equal to energy E all over H. So the energy now is 10 times 1.6 times 10 raised to power 
times 10 raised to power minus 19 all over the Planck constant that is given. Remember, the Planck constant will have 6.6 times 10 raised to power minus 34. When you are solving this, please always be careful. Be careful with the use of your calculator. If your calculator, most times this raised to power gives a wrong answer. So what you do is to pick out all these values you can calculate on your own. This one, 10 times this will give us 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 18. Remember, the 10 raised to power 1 minus 19 will give us minus 18. All over 6.6 .6 times 10 raised to power minus 34. So I don't want to use calculator now. But if you're using your calculator, be sure you're getting the right thing. So we can say 1.6 over 6.6 .6 times i'll pick this one now 10 raised to the power minus 18 this division gives minus then minus 34 remember your indices this division is minus so 1.6 all over 6.6 .6 will give us 0 0.24 times 10 raised to the power minus 18 minus minus will give us plus 34 so minus minus will give us plus 34 so we'll have minus 18 plus 34 will be raised to power 16 so we can decide to convert this to 2.4 times 10 raised to power 15 remember it's the frequency f that we are looking for and the unit of frequency is hertz please always remember the unit so this is the frequency that we are looking for then equation 2 said we should find the I, I said we should find the wavelength. For us to get the, get the wavelength, remember we have two major formulas that E is equal to HF. And also we got that E is equal to HC over the wavelength. So we are going to use the second one to find the wavelength. So if you are going to use, therefore, the wavelength, now make the wavelength the subject of the formula so that it will be equal to hey c upon e remember this will take this place it will come down so that we have the wavelength to be hey c upon lambda h is known c is known then the energy remember the energy we already got it if we are using this we are going to find out that the wavelength is hey c upon e h is given as 6.6 .6 times 10 raised to power minus 34 times the speed of light is 3 times 10 raised to power 8 all over e remember up we got our e as 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 18 remember how we got the e after getting the difference in energy we converted it to from electron volt to joules so let's calculate this out so that we'll have our wavelength to be 6.6 .6 times this is going to give us 6.6 .6 times 3 will give us 19.8 times 10. If I'm picking this minus 34, remember your indices is plus 8. I don't want to use calculator here. So that's times 10 raised to power minus 19. I can decide to pick this too. Calculate it out. Then minus 34 plus 8. Then minus minus division and this. When you use your, if you want to use your calculator at the end, you're going to get 1. The final answer will be 1.24 times 10 raised to power minus 7. The unit of wavelength is in meters. Please don't forget to put the unit. So our final answer will be lambda is equal to 1.24 times 10 raised to power minus 7 meters please remember to like subscribe share this video and follow through the lessons this is just part one of it we have more to offer before the exam proper